This is Governor Larry Hogan, and I don't always have time to listen to podcasts, but uh, I do enjoy listening to the Maryland Crabs podcast. Live from a grungy kitchen table located in Annapolis, Maryland's scenic and historic capital, it's the Maryland Crabs podcast. With each episode, your hosts, Tim Hamilton, John Frenet, and the occasional guest will dive in and pick apart the stuff that really matters most to you. We're too lazy to actually solve any of these problems, but we can definitely stir the pot. From schools, politics, parking in the fire lane, to those horrible people who drive BMWs. And here with this week's episode, live from the kitchen table, Tim Hamilton and John Frenet. It's Maryland crap time. I'm back from LA. Uh, singing lessons didn't work out too well, did they? I did Aruba, and then two weeks later did L.A. We need a jingle. I could write one That's on the plane. Yeah, there I'll you go. will be in Ireland uh, in another few weeks, and I can write the jingle one on, on the plane. There you go. Hey, make sure you like us on all the places that you like. And actually, go to Apple Podcasts, review us, give us a review, give us a five-star rating, and uh, just subscribe. It's the easiest way to get us there if you like the stuff that we have. We've got a great episode coming up today. We're going to be talking with outgoing, retiring president of St. John's College, Chris Nelson, and uh, had a real good conversation with him. His office was cool. I liked his office. It was, yeah. No, his office was really neat, and, and you wouldn't think it, it was not very presidential. No, and I made a joke in there that the last time I was a president, the college president's office didn't yeah. go well. I wasn't kidding. Yeah. <laughs> it, it did not go well at all. <laughs> That's so funny. I felt I would redeem myself today. But yeah, no, it's uh, the end of the, end of the school year and uh, the end of a career uh, as president of the college with Christopher Nelson, and we thought we would go in, sit down in his office, and uh, have a sit-in until he agreed to talk to us. And before we talk about, we go to the interview, rather, uh, there's one thing I want to talk about. It's uh, segues are for socks anyway. But I was just going to, I want to talk about the net neutrality. That's what I'm always pounding the drum on on Facebook and Twitter. I think that's, that's we've had such a heavy news cycle for the last few weeks that it's really kind of fallen to the wayside. And I'm hoping that this debate is still going on by the time that this airs. But for those who don't know, the, the current FCC chairman, uh, he is taking a look at net neutrality. He's a former Verizon uh, attorney, and he is not a big believer in net neutrality. In fact, he's very opposed to it. And what net neutrality is, is that all internet traffic is supposed to be treated equally. So if you have a, a website that uh, is a mom and pop versus Netflix versus Google, right. but all websites are Ion Annapolis equal. versus exactly. Google. Well, this is now it's turned into a left and right battle, and this is where I just want to let people know it's not a left or right battle. In fact, if you are Alex Jones on Infowars, or if you are uh, The Blaze, or if you're Fox News, this is going to affect you just like it affects everyone else. What happens is that the cable companies, that's Comcast, Time Warner, Charter, you know, whoever owns the, the backbone right. of the internet now, they want it to to be reclass or the, the internet carriers be reclassified because right now it is it's regulated so that they could charge more and they swear that they're not going to do it but they're going to that they can charge a fast lane a slow lane that they can give preferential tra- treatment from one website fox to another. news fox news is paying more advertising with them or something like that they could effectively give them a open open channel exactly or, and cnn could be slow as molasses right there's so if you have a website or if you have a podcast let's say and all of a sudden you know you're not paying it for a certain tier that it's being downloaded at a particularly slow rate um or that it's uh it's not as robust but this is an incredibly incredibly important uh, issue that, that i'm not being dramatic could end the internet as we know it that the internet that we've come to know and love over the last 22 years could could absolutely slow to uh be owned by by essentially a monopoly and i think it's been it's under the radar of, of most people and i think other people because the republicans are the one who are pushing the end of no net neutrality then all of a sudden it's become a republican congress is, is pushing for the end is uh, especially uh blackburn uh, marsha blackburn who is tennessee i think right but uh, most in con- Congress are opposed to the move, aren't they? No, it's or is, it, is this pretty split? It's pretty split, and I think the the, the problem is because it's it comes down to to con- con- campaign contributions. It's that simple, uh, and they will say it's been positioned as well. This is government control over the internet. That's not true any more than than the, the First Amendment gives the government control over free speech, or the regulation of the airlines or the banks gave the government control over the airlines or banks. It just doesn't happen. What net neutrality does is keep the status quo as it is right now. So what people can do is three years ago, John Oliver on the day on the was weekly show was that tonight show? Daily tonight? show. Daily, no, no, no. 
it's a weekly but John Oliver John Oliver, John Oliver tonight. <laughs> but he had a great piece where he he sent everyone to the FCC site for commenting and they crashed the site right. because it was the most mo- it was the most public comments they ever received in their history so what the FCC da- has done is they've made it a lot trickier to comment uh, they to, to leave a comment but everyone and I, I know this people's eyes kind of glaze over with net neutrality it's a very obscure and abstract concept but I, I'm telling you this is so critically important that you have to go to the FCC and comment and the best way to do it is that John Oliver set up a direct link to where you want to comment and it's gofccyourself.com so if you <laughs> And go to gofccyourself.com. That link will take you directly to the comments section for the net neutrality. And it's very important that you do that. Call your congressman. Uh, let them know that, that the net neutrality is imperative to commerce in this country, uh, to, to freedom in the country. And again, I, I'm not being dramatic. This is if you are a business owner of any kind and you have a website or you have an email or you have anything, this is critically important because this, this is going to have a direct impact on your business, no matter what it is, left or right. That's so. Uh, that is my soapbox. That's what I'm pounding right now. What you can do also, if you're unsure who your congressman is, you can text your zip code to five zero four zero nine. That's cool. And this used to be just a service run that would tell you who your congressman is, but now it's a little bit left leaning. It comes back and says, "Welcome to Resist Bot. Welcome yeah, to." The Re- yeah. But ignore all that stuff. It will tell you. Uh, I put in my zip code here and said, "Nicely done." Your senators are Benjamin L. Cardin and Chris Van Hollen, um, and then it gives you options to be able to contact them and stuff. And like definitely, that. definitely call, contact them. This is th- again. I cannot emphasize how important this is because there is no unringing this bell. If it happens, that is, that is it, and it's going to change the internet forever. Uh, it, it's extremely serious. What's well, funny? You talk about ringing the bell. It's- Gold's almost out. Yeah, you know, so I'm looking at your daughter's <laughs> stuff all piled up in our studio. Yeah, it smells like a college kid sneaker in there. Is that uh, her bong? Which, which is what is... No, no, it's a bottle of wine. Yeah. Uh, maybe convert it into a bong, I don't know. <laughs> we're, not, we're not doing this for a fact, too. Uh, we're sitting in a room with a pile of, of boxes and blankets and <laughs> dirty laundry. Yeah, no, she uh, just got done for her uh, sophomore year. A little bit of a disruption. She's over at school in D.C. at oh, yeah. And there was a little disruption with the uh, racist incidents on campus that the FBI is investigating. But maybe not anymore. Now they don't have a <laughs> they don't have a head. Well, they probably do by the time we we are this. I think, um, unless he's fired a bunch of other people. Yeah, yeah. Rumor, rumor has it that uh, Giuliani was at Trump Hotel last night in D.C. Wonder whether he's the American in me. It would be appalled, but the. The guy in me who loves drama would <laughs> I mean, just be awesome. <laughs> That's why I'm waiting. Matter of fact, I'm going to cut this short in a little bit because I want to go see this, the Sean Spicer. Uh, he's, although I don't think he's doing the presser today. Of course, this happened like, pro- pro- probably a not. week or so before. But um, so what happened with probably, that American? Yeah, University? no, they're they're investigating the whole thing. They, somebody had hung bananas in nooses around the campus. Uh, That's and, random. And the students that you know felt really marginalized. It was they were marked as tagged with African American sorority. Uh, like AKA, which is Alpha Kappa Alpha, you know, go away or go home or something along those lines. Weird at American U, which um, to me, I, am I wrong? Is that that's a fairly liberal school, isn't it? It is a fairly liberal school. Um, it's 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 just very it's strange. I mean, I'm very disappointed in the administration's handling of it. Uh, I think the president should have come out and owned it. Uh, but he didn't. He just sort of sent a memo out and sent his flunkies out to talk to people. So I think that was a little bit disappointing. But um, it is what it is. But speaking of presidents of universities and colleges, today we're going to be talking to Chris Nelson, who is retiring with St. John's College, and we'll get right to him in just a second. All right. Spring is waiting outside your door, and it's time to make your lawn and garden beautiful again with Homestead Gardens. Their experts will show you how to make a safe lawn for kids and pets using the area's largest selection of organic lawn solutions. Share family fun and satisfaction growing food, flowers, and shrubs together. Visit Homestead Gardens in Davidsonville or Severna Park, Maryland, and go to homesteadgardens.com for deals, events, and workshops. Live life outdoors this season with Homestead Gardens. And we are here with Chris Nelson, who is the retiring president of St. John's College here in Annapolis. And we thank you very much for taking time out of your day to between the end of classes and graduation is when this is being recorded. How are you today? I'm just fine. And it's a pleasure to be with you, John. St. John's, I mean, we want to come in and talk a little bit about certainly about your career. You've been here for 26 years. That's right. All of those years as president. Yes. And 
You've seen an awful lot of changes both in Annapolis as well as in St. John's. Yes, indeed. Um, what's, what's really changed? Well, some of my reflections go back to the days when I was a student at St. John's College. I was here between 1966 and 1970, and I still remember the power lines downtown uh, that were visible and all. But I think it was... That can't be because that wouldn't be historically accurate. And uh, the, you'd have the, the Preservation <laughs> Society wouldn't allow it to happen. When did that happen then? Well, I, <laughs> they don't exist now. It never, no, no, no. It's always looked like this. Oh, yes. And of course. Downtown Annapolis is always like <laughs> the way they, it does right now. They can't see winks on the, <laughs> on the recorded thing. <laughs> you just gave me that scary president look that I got in 1992, the last time I was in a president's office. It did not go well. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, no, I think I remember very shortly after I arrived, uh, they were repaving or rebricking the uh, streets downtown, Main Street and the a circle around the State House. And what I think the main thing that I've noticed about the town and just its physical appearance is that the historic district has become more and more beautiful with every decade. Um, I remember it as a student when you know the fishing boats, commercial fishing boats, were down in the harbor when you could get your fresh fish at the market house. And that's obviously changed. Yeah. But that had changed when I came in 1991 as well. Where did you come from? Chicago. Okay. I moved back to Chicago to practice law for 18 years and then came straight from the law practice to St. John's. Were you from there originally? Yes, I was born in Chicago. You don't but, have the accent. Well, there are people in Chicago never said that. <laughs> <laughs> but I was raised pretty much in suburban New York. I grew up uh, in White Plains, New York. My father moved his position from Chicago to New York City. And IBM? We lived. <laughs> no, he was a management consultant. Uh, had his own business uh, representing institutions of higher education and libraries. And then he merged that uh, eventually with Pete Marwick and Mitchell and built the entire practice for Pete Marwick in the higher education field. He's still here, and he's in Annapolis as well. He thinks of Annapolis as his second or third home after Chicago and New York because he's also a graduate of St. John's College. Oh, your dad is too. And he's the former chairman of the board here. You know, my father was chairman of the board of his college, and they wanted, he wanted me to go there in the worst way. <laughs> and I remember my meeting with my admissions officer saying, okay, I need the thin envelope. I don't care how you do it, but you need to get me the thin envelope. There's no way in hell I'm going to school where my father is chairman of the board of trustees. Well, it's very interesting. My dad, of course, had the books that St. John's College is known for all over the house. So I was always reading them, but I didn't hear from him much at all about the college. He was a very quiet man, still is a quiet man, but my mother used to say, your father, Chris, is the smartest man I ever met, and it wasn't his family, I can tell you that. <laughs> so she said, it must be St. John's College, and uh, she always was a big fan of the college, even though she didn't attend it. Uh, back, of course, in those days, it was a men's school, and she had graduated from Oberlin, but I think it was probably the influence of the books and my father's gentle teaching or questioning of me that brought me. And, and the other part of it, I suppose, was my frustration with high school. Uh, I was a good student, but I, I just hated the notion that I had to listen to another lecture and that I had to feed back on tests, whatever it was the teacher thought was important. I wanted so much to make my education my own and to participate in it. Um, and then I thought there were actually books that I probably would never read on my own, and there was a college with the courage to say some things are better than others, and this looked like the school for me, so I applied only to St. John's College. Uh, it filled every expectation, and it's just those kinds of qualities that bring students to the college today, a frustration with the traditional educational experience. Now, has uh, the education changed much since you were here versus what today's ter Sunday's graduates are? In, in a fundamental way, education at St. John's hasn't changed. Books have been rotated off the program and new books brought on. Uh, it's a very active uh, process of reviewing the program all year long every year. There's a committee that does nothing but curriculum work. And so you can point to many aspects of the curriculum that have changed. Certainly science plays a much bigger role on the curriculum than it did when the Great Books program was started here in 1937. And music has had a much greater influence uh, at the college. We do only two foreign languages now, and we once used to do four, one in each year, uh, Greek, Latin, German, French. And now we concentrate on Greek, ancient Greek, and modern French uh, with some work in English poetry. Those would be the biggest 
changes over time that the college has seen, and it's still pretty much uh, an all-required curriculum with books that are read in the original form without mediation through textbooks or professional lectures and read in roughly chronological sequence. We have a faculty that teaches across the entire curriculum, so we don't have any departments. This is one of the great pleasures of being president of St. John's College. You don't have departmental wars. And you graduated with a degree in liberal arts or a bachelor's ba- bachelor in bachelor of arts, arts mm-hmm. uh, in liberal, liberal arts studies. And Presumably went to law school then Yes, at that point. Right. Went straight on to the University of Utah Law School because I graduated in the Mountain West and had married a Mountain Westerner. Okay. So we decided to stay in the West. And I went to law school from 70 to 73, built a family as we were getting relocated in Chicago and practiced law there before coming. So which campus did you did you attend? Was it this one in Santa Fe? Three years in Annapolis and one year in Santa Fe. How, how big is, I mean, there's... About, what, 800 students between the two campuses? Is it it pretty evenly split? Pretty evenly split. And the ideal would probably be 400 to 450 on each campus in the undergraduate program. And then we have another 50 to 80 students in the Graduate Institute. And both campuses have a Graduate Institute as well. You know, what's interesting is you think it would be that much different, um, Santa Fe and Annapolis. But, I mean, I, I lived in New Mexico for five years. And... I always said that Albuquerque was like Baltimore and Santa Fe is like Annapolis. <laughs> well, there is, no, there is something like that. Uh, it's very, very similar. Once you get inside the classroom, you can't distinguish between the two campuses. Uh, and when we have faculty coming together, as they sit around the table, if you didn't know the people individually, you wouldn't know which campus they were from because they speak out of the heart of the college. Um, sort of speaks well to the way you've integrated it all. Well, that's true, too. I mean, the faculty's done a marvelous job of doing that, and we try to adhere to a kind of principle of transferability on the on the campuses. If we are going to permit students to have an experience on the other campus, we want to make sure that the program is seamless pretty much the same on the two. If we experiment or have differences, it's most likely going to be in the senior year because nobody will have to have had that year in order to transfer uh, to the other campus. So we do see some changes there. And that's consistent with the notion that if they're going to be changes, it's most likely going to be in the more modern books. It takes time to determine which books are most important, which ones are going to be most influential on our society, and certainly in the areas of science and technology, uh, which are rapidly changing. Mm-hmm. That's the place where the curriculum at the college undergoes the greatest change. So I had a liberal arts education. I went to a small college in western Pennsylvania that was uh, very similar uh, as far as the way it looks on the You don't play window. croquet, though. No, I don't. It was, <laughs> it was Catholic. You know, Catholics and croquet don't do it. But it was... Um, I always say that if you go to liberal arts school, you kill it in jeopardy. You know, that's that's where you start right there, is that uh, you have a, a broader... We, we actually did have a national jeopardy champion. Oh, did you really? Who's a graduate of St. John's College. <laughs> it's Well, because, you, I mean, you're getting exposure to everything. I was telling... Mm-hmm. I, we were writing here. I was, I was telling, talking to John about that, and I said, you know, the nice thing about the education that I had was that it gave me a very broad education, and it, as far as, you know, I was trained as a writer. I've had five careers since 1992 when I graduated, but I always thought, what happens if you're an attorney or a doctor or a accountant and that you know you specialize that and you come out and you're like I don't like this I don't you know whereas you have a liberal arts education you you have a broad base to education that you can apply to any number of disciplines really no, I think what you said is really pertinent, and it's one of the reasons. See, John, <laughs> it's one of the reasons that we have a popular graduate institute. There are students that come out of other schools, and they suddenly realize I don't like what I majored in, or I've started it, and I realize this is not for me. That I found something else that I love, or I'm not sure what I want. I need to get an education that'll ground me in fundamentals. That, that, that was that was me when I was younger. I mean, I I'm 55. I'm not sure I still know what I want, <laughs> but. And two-thirds of my children have gone through that. They've gone through, my one was going through early ed, early elementary education. She's like, oh, yeah, no, this is not for me. And now she's looking to get into the Peace Corps. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, sort of did something on like my other son. You know, he was you know, graphic design, law enforcement. I mean, he had no idea. Air Force, and now he's doing cybersecurity for University of Maryland system. So it's it, there's something to be said about that. that well, you're, you're a good example of what we see all over the country. You know, people are not in guilds. and practicing the same thing that their fathers and mothers did for centuries. If they're going to have more than one career, they're going to have many, and it's going to be 
whatever it's it is. It's going to be different than it was 10 years ago. Well, I, I think they, they say that the students that are graduating today uh, are being prepared for jobs that don't exist in six years. Uh, I, I can't remember exactly what the phrase no, I think is. That, I think again, you know, if, if you're able to adapt and you know, take your knowledge and apply it, I think you're in, in much better shape than But it's not just the job market. I think what, what we've seen probably in the last 10, maybe 15 years in the country is a certain brand of anti-intellectualism that really bothers me, especially when it comes to science, where there's people who are confronting science, but they're not doing it in a way that's constructive. They're doing it just because it's part of a political ideology. And I see that with the education system that, that you have right now that's, that harkens back to the Industrial Revolution. You, we were training people to be good factory workers, That's and we haven't changed much since then. So my kids go to school and i know you look anecdotally at the way you were raised and say well the way i was raised and educated was better than kids today and that's not necessarily true but i will say that my kids aren't getting a good dose of literature they're not getting poetry they're not being required to to read any of the books that that we would consider to be traditionally great in the country uh you're not seeing a lot of the history being being taught a lot of it seems to be a more practical kind of education but i think that that liberal arts colleges are preserve that sort of intellectual curiosity that you're not seeing at other schools it, and it really bothers me. Yeah, it's a very curious thing. The United States has always been a country built on practical values. Utility has been a watchword for Americans from the beginning. So this isn't new, that we have people wanting a training for life in a practical world. We didn't have an aristocracy that was educated to be gentlemen and ladies, to be princes and kings and queens. But at the same time, it's only in the United States where a liberal education flourished. And it's flourished for the better part of, well, 300 years since, a little more over 300 years since St. John's came into being. And that's, I suppose, a reaction to this teaching or education for practical purposes. But it's also something that arises quite naturally out of the freedoms that we enjoy in the United States. Uh, the more we move to centralized administration and control of higher education, for example, the more likely we're going to lose the freedom that makes schools like St. John's and other independent liberal arts colleges uh, hard to maintain. It's difficult to fight this encroachment that you cite. It's has, very has, real. Has the interest in St. John's waned over the over your tenure? I mean, as far as, uh, you know, I, 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 you, I know you can measure it in the number of applicants and, and, and everything else, but I mean, do you, do you see a waning of a program such as this, or is it fairly consistent? Uh, it's been consistently on the rise with an exception or two along the way. Interest in the college has probably grown in the last few years, but in, in response to the economic downturn in 2008, liberal arts colleges generally were seen as luxuries by much of the sure. population. Uh, they were worried uh, with unemployment rates relatively high and with uh, mortgages, uh, with, with house prices overhyped, uh, that they weren't going to have money for retirement and they weren't going to be able to raise their children. So they were talking more about jobs, 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 mm -hmm. and worried that liberal arts colleges couldn't prepare students for them. It was a complete false notion. Well, it was also that, you know, your return on investment with your child or, or going into debt. I know that Belmont Abbey, the economic downturn hit around 2009 in earnest. Right. I remember about 2011, 2012, Belmont Abbey came out and said, hey, we're cutting our our tuition from 32 grand, we're going right down to 18 because we're giving out, and but we're not going to do financial aid packages because we're just going to take it all it all comes out in the wash we're just going to go down to eighteen thousand, no financial aid and i thought that was going to be the model moving forward and i don't think it really was no uh, some schools have successfully uh, put into place a program like that and they were responding to what you were just talking about you're on a lower level st anne's day school here did that as well they, yeah. they roll back their tuition if you have a lot of local uh, competition uh, that is, if Belmont p may have most of its competition in the region, for right. example. I don't know, but I just make that assumption. Then it's very easy for you to measure what the effect of a sure. price change is going to make. If you're competing on a national level, it's much, much more difficult. You know, you can't ask us to identify any school in the country that is a competitor in the sense that, you know, we have a substantial number of students going or applying to two or three school, same, of the same schools. Uh, we have hundreds of schools that our students apply to, and the overlap might be three 
or two or four students a year, period, uh, with any other school. Uh, and there it's much more difficult to try to assess the impact of the whole national or international uh, influence on uh, tuition and, and pricing general. So some of these programs have worked well with the cuts. Others have not. Uh, and where they've not, schools are rapidly putting back in place the higher tuition strategy they had, and they're simply uh, making much more financial aid available because people sense a bargain, not just in a lower price, but in a higher financial aid package. Right. It's not rational what the public out there is feeling. Uh, very often you'll find people who would rather go to a school where the bottom line is higher because the tuition is high and the financial aid is high than going to a school where the tuition is lower. They associate quality with price very mm -hmm. often. And this makes it difficult for colleges and universities to determine how best to uh, set a, a price that makes sense for its students and uh, for the families that they want to draw to the college. And also, I mean, it, it, basically it is a business. You're covering operating costs, and, and I mean, that's a big part of, of no, the No, that's structure. right. So, you know, in the past decade, the real cost of education in independent colleges has actually uh, not risen at all. It's dropped a little bit, about 6%. When I say the real cost, I mean the inflation-adjusted price for the average family, despite increasing tuition, has actually dropped uh, because of the increases in financial aid. At St. John's, it's dropped a lot more than 6%. So the answer uh, to your original question is, um, when the public was responding more to price in the years, I think you were correct in saying a lot of this happened not in 2008 or even 2009. It happened in 2011 and 12. Uh, those were the years that were very hard for liberal arts colleges. But since uh, 1991, when I came, uh, when we had 303 applications, our applicant pool is more than triple that today. Uh, and uh, we need that because the face of the college and its reputation has grown such that our competition, uh, schools that the, uh, our students are likely to apply to, have also changed and uh, become a more selective bunch of schools. So when you're talking about the college experience in general, I think we all have our own stories. Uh, I, you and I both went to a small liberal arts college. Where'd you go? I, mean, uh, I went to Marietta out in Ohio for a year and then graduated out of Temple. Okay, so, so which was a larger school, so your experience is going to be different. Mm -hmm. Than, than ours for the most part. And what's interesting to me, we were, again, we were talking about this coming in, we were talking about the phenomenon, which isn't new, I mean, it's being called new, but of the protests that you're seeing at, at elite Ivy League schools like Yale and Stanford and um, I'm trying to think of others, but where you, you're having this free, free speech debate, and which isn't new because this happened with the baby boom generation back in the in the 60s so it's certainly just history repeating itself but the ex I, I was wondering so the experience that you have going to Yale or to St. John's or to University of Maryland these are all three separate experiences that, right. that are are of value to the people who who go to these schools what do you think draws people to that particular college experience that's different because the experience you I, I was saying you know I my school, I, I'm an adjunct instructor there, and I don't see that political activism that I would see at Yale or Harvard or, or at these so-called elite schools. And why does that occur at those schools and not at schools, liberal arts schools or, or University and, and of Maryland? I, I would argue that St. John's, by almost not by definition, but would be considered a liberal school. Yeah, not just liberal arts, but liberal. Uh, as, as far as, you know, in, in liberal conservative type. Yeah, but I mean, I mean my school that. is telling you that is that it's a Catholic school. But it it's it can be fairly liberal in, in its thinking. Which yeah, is not, I, but I mean, I've heard nothing. You know, there's I, you, you've heard nothing locally about any uprisings or you no. know, and, and I'm sure personally, there everybody has their own. Yeah, but I think I can't, couldn't answer your question whether the students here are more liberal, middle of the road, or conservative. They're actually here to study, and we don't see an awful lot of that. We do have students who write frequently um, where for the student newspaper and others uh, where it's very clear that they have strong political views left and right but I think this is probably the most apolitical campus I've ever been on. Hmm. So they've, they've, they've just figured a way to take the political climate, which is, you know, the wall in the room, but and and put it aside for four years. 
it, to but the, the I think, to the and point. sorry to interrupt, but, but that's my arg- that's been my argument with people, especially if you're watching Fox News or anyone who has a conservative bent, where they said that colleges are hotbeds of liberalism. Well, I mean, first of all, kids are younger, and you're going to be more liberal when you're younger. That's just how it happens. And as you age, you become more conservative. But my my argument is that it's only a very small handful of colleges that you're seeing this political activism, that the vast majority, you're not seeing that. Not to say that people don't have political views, but you're just not seeing those protests. You're not seeing the, the people upset at particular speakers coming in. Uh, you know, I think that you, if you if you came down to it, it's probably a couple dozen, maybe, that, that have this political activism, and they always have had that political activism. They're just schools that more have more of a propensity to them. Yeah, and yet I doubt that there are very many st- students who choose a school because they want to go to a politically active place. Right. They may want to go to a school that puts into practice some of the things they're supposed to be learning, and very often that's a political practice. So they may be wanting to go to a school which is less concerned about fundamentals and origins of things and more concerned about how you're going to confront today's hot-button issues. The problem with trying to start the conversation with today's hot-button issues is you don't have a foundation for it. Mm-hmm. And what we're trying to do is build a foundation. It was very interesting. I, when I came here, I started a, a seminar series for adults, uh, executive seminars. And in the first uh, city that I set it up in was Annapolis. Very few people in Annapolis in what I would call the circle of people who uh, run the institutions in this town, political, cultural, social, and uh, artistic associations, they really didn't know St. John's very well. And I invited people in to read, one of the first readings was the Melian Dialogue from Thucydides' Peloponnesian War. I just read that last night. You read it last night, you said? No, I watched Survivor. <laughs> <laughs> but it's a, it, it's a very contemporary problem. Athens is um, a bully state, and it, it tells this little island colony uh, that wants to remain neutral, you either become one of our allies or we'll kill you. Uh, so it's a might makes right. And the little guy stands up and says, no. And Athens comes back and wipes them all out. This is a chilling story. On the other hand, you see this kind of policy at play in the world. What does it mean to say might makes right? What is justice in war? Well, if you start by talking about what we should be doing in Syria or Afghanistan uh, or um, Iraq uh, or any other hotspot in North Korea or wherever, you're already bringing all sorts of prejudices to the table. You start with Thucydides' Peloponnesian War, and it's a war that was a magnificent war to, to learn something from, but it isn't yours. And so you can reflect on it with a kind of dispassionate regard and think about the underlying issues and how you might bring those to bear into a modern world. So a lot of our students are addressing these kinds of questions, but they're addressing them in a way that doesn't require them to run the risk, personal risk. Professional, though. Yeah, I thought I had it off. The uh, risk of um, exposing themselves in front of their friends about whether they're left or right, whether they're for or against a particular uh, war that is going on in the world, that kind of thing. Well, I think that reflects larger on our society is that there's no room for reason debate anymore. There's just not. Maybe you can blame that on social media. You can blame that on cable news. Uh, and certainly they, they bear a lot of responsibility for that. But there is no reasoned, rational debate based in facts. And I really lament that. I think it's right that what the world needs most is what it's always needed. But it seems to need it more in spades today, which is a reason to bring to bear on a, a conflict and a resolution and probably some imagination that we're still knocking out of our students uh, to come up with solutions that they might not have thought about. That is, when I say the imagination, and that's where you're missing something in the lack of literature. Exactly. Uh, This is going to help you cultivate and develop an imagination. You want to, the world is never going to be perfect. You want to build a life where you can make a difference in the world. You want to improve the world around you for your sake, for your family's sake, for your neighbors, and frankly, for the world that you were born into because you have no choice but to accept that world, you might as well love it and in loving it, give 
back to it somehow to make it better. The problem How do you do that? Is you have to be able to imagine what a better world is. You have to be able to recognize the current and imagine the future. And those are two skills that um, are in short supply. Because I, that goes back to the anti-intellectualism that I was talking about. Is that that it's frowned upon to do that? I think you know you look at the allegory of Plato's cave. You know that the reality is exactly what is presented to you, and you don't know any different. The social media is that. Is a, a, you know I, I'm I'm a user of social media. I like social media, um, but but if you look at social media and again cable news, they're presenting a reality that that is not true. It's just not, and people are accepting that that that's the way things are. And I think people have lost the the ability to reason for themselves. I sound like an old crank, you know, an old guy saying when I was growing up, and I'm not saying that things were ideal, but right now I think we've hit a peak period when it comes to the division and identity politics and people who are not applying literature and history and philosophy to solve real world problems. It's just not happening. I gotta be honest with you, I was you know, I was a little concerned when Mattis was nominated for defense secretary because I I'm, I'm not a big believer in having uh, a military in charge of defense. I think it should be a civilian, but he's a very learned man. You know, yes. he, and he he he's well read with the classics and he's well read with uh, within history. So I mean I feel comfortable with him in that position. But I, I just see so many people who are in politics and running now that, that frown on that uh, the intellectualism they see that as elitist and I just don't know why knowledge has become elite, elitist yeah I, I think there's a bigger problem in politics today and this is an old problem as old as as human relations uh, goes but when I think about what the world needs in its leadership it needs a little humility it needs leaders who understand that they don't know all there is to know and that one builds a future and an understanding of the world on the basis of ignorance. That is, you come to school because you desire to learn something. Why do you desire it? You desire it because you don't have it and you think you need it. I know that I know not. Yes, and that's the sort of thing that we need in our leaders. They need to know not only that they don't know, but they need to have a pretty good idea of what they don't know. I think our founding fathers in the Age of Enlightenment, it was interesting is that you had to be cajoled to run for for office. That's the way you that have to be convinced. The, that's the yeah. history of the selection of the deanship at St. John's College. You know, generally at most colleges, the president brings in a dean, usually from outside, a, a professional administrator in academic affairs. At St. John's and in a small number of other schools, uh, the dean is selected from within the faculty. And in our case, while I make the recommendation to the Board of Governors, and the Board of Governors actually makes the appointment, I only get a single recommendation from a committee uh, composed of senior members of the faculty, tenured members of the faculty, uh, and they need to persuade people uh, to run, the people they think can provide the best advice to the president and to the other officers of the college, the person who can speak best about what are the core values of the institution, uh, what St. John stands for, and protect those things, and the people who can help them make the changes that they want to see made. And one of the nice things about it, it's a five-year term. I work now with five deans in my tenure, and each one brings something different, but also brings a different um, desire for change and things that they care about. And the faculty kind of knows that. So the faculty is adjusting all the time by bringing forward to the president a dean that can help the president move in a direction that the faculty would like to see us go. And it's just kept building the foundation. Yeah. I mean, on, on top of that. No, you had mentioned before we, before we started that, that St. John's College is not necessarily right here and in Santa Fe. Uh, in a not not a physical way, obviously those are the two locations, um, but more on the national on the national front that uh, that you're involved with. Yeah, well, I mentioned a little earlier that it seemed that the college going public was turning more and more to a utilitarian view of education. That people were going to schools because they thought they could get a job training, and more often than not, that means being trained for yesterday's job rather than tomorrow's. But just the language of the marketplace uh, it does damage to higher education, that students are now seen as consumers, that the educational institutions provide value added. It's If all we wanted to do in life is live by an economic metaphor, just imagine what shallow lives we'd be living. If everything in life has a price and nothing is priceless, we lose our humanity, frankly. So... One of the things that I've done uh, nationally, and I think with basically the help and support of St. John's College generally, is to try to provide the case for 
an education that rises above, that shoots for something much higher than the simple economic value. We're not producing cogs in a global marketplace. We're trying to help individuals achieve a kind of freedom that can make their lives richer and better and, frankly, uh, support a democratic society and the institutions that keep this country strong. So after 21 years, you are a huge part of the fabric of St. John's as it is right now. So 26. 26, sorry. Uh, so That's you should have studied math in college a little no, bit. No, I'm, I'm a writer. I don't need math. <laughs> I don't like it. So uh, you're, you're a big part of the fabric of the, the way the school, the culture, and, and the way it runs and, and the way it educates. So with, with your leaving, I know that's going to be a huge change you know, for the students, for the faculty, for the brand, for the mission. You know, I've heard this from some people, but I'd never really felt it in my bones. I, I felt like I was on a honeymoon the first 15 or 16 years, like I was still brand new. And, and the nice thing about it was that I was actually being treated like I was on a honeymoon. <laughs> Uh, and then things got hard. <laughs> um, and that has something to do with the national temperament and so on, and not, not, a, not the local environment here. So I've always felt that I was joining an institution, and if I lead, I try to lead from within. I've never felt that I was establishing the image of the college on itself from within. Now, from outside, of course, the people who come to know me outside very often don't know anything more about the college than what... I stand for what I say. That would be true of any president in the country. And yet, I certainly have received wonderful words and kind notes from faculty, students, and staff who have expressed their affection. And that's very nice. It's a lot better than being run out of town on a rail, I can tell you that. (laughs) That's true. You are addressing the commencement. I am. Is this the first commencement address that you've done at St. John's? At St. John's, yes, and I'm doing it on both campuses. It was a really nice thing to have the senior classes in both places recommend this to the presidents, and this president couldn't say no, so I am addressing them. I've done commencement speeches at other schools, high schools and Mm -hmm. colleges, and I do an annual convocation address where I welcome new students and their families to the college. That's a big tradition here. Uh, and I well, try. St. John's is full of traditions. I mean, you've got the ringing of the bells. You've well, got, uh, you've got you know, croquet, which is uh, you know something a little bit else. But I mean, boy, that sure has grown into something. Um, that's that's quite, blown up, yeah. That's quite an event, yeah. Gotten bigger and bigger. But one of the traditions is welcoming uh, new students and families into the college using a language and images that help them understand that we actually stand for the things we say we do in our materials, that parents don't need to be afraid of leaving their students with us, that is, we're both a caring uh, communal uh, organization, but we're also a school that uh, is, takes education seriously. Uh, And so that address tries to do this. Well, this is the first time I get to turn that around and now say we've been welcoming you into something that I once called the Wonderland of St. John's College. And now we're going to see you out into the world, which is a different kind of Wonderland. And uh, so I'm still playing with that address right right now as we speak. After the address, uh, after 26 years, uh, you're going down to Ocean City to Secrets. (laughs) (laughs) Hey, what's what's next for uh, Chris Nelson after after commencement? I mean, you're you're leaving at the end of June. That's right. So Joyce and I, my wife Joyce and I, uh, have lived in a home owned by the college for 26 years. Uh, We're buying our first house since Uh, 1986. So the first house in 30 years, <laughs> which we've now done. And we're having it repainted and have lots of bookcases built in it. And we read in the uh, Capitol that, that you are staying local. so You are staying local. So we're moving just a mile and a half away. And we move two weeks from today. When we're using a local mover here. It's been 26 town. years. It still stinks. <laughs> you know, it was still stinks. I got to say, there's an awful lot to move. And, <laughs> and we have, unfortunately, a huge storage area in the new house, which only encourages us to you say, well, let's make the de- it, yeah. we can make the decision what to, what to get uh-huh. rid of after we move. But we're, we're moving, and um, I'm going to take some time with Joyce uh, doing a little travel. We have a small log house in a 
wooded area on an island two and a half hours northeast of Green Bay, Wisconsin, and there's nobody who lives there, so we're going to go up there and read. It's still uh, read. snowing up there, yeah. <laughs> it's still snowing <laughs> up there. Yeah, my brother-in-law is the ferry boat captain, and oh, my, wow. my sister has had three jobs, being the art and, director of the Art and Nature Center, the archivist for the island, and a librarian. Uh, so it's, it's a small place where everybody has three jobs, if they have any at all, and the rest of us are retirees. But I'll be writing a book, or putting together a collection of stories and, and speeches that I've given, uh, putting together uh, a photographic album of gardens, is something that Joyce and I have worked on over the years as, as a second project. And then after a little time and travel, visiting 16 grandchildren and five very different parts of the continent, um, we will come back to St. John's, and I'm going to uh, be on the teaching faculty. I consider that a promotion <laughs> from the presidency. I'm convinced. Took you long I, enough, huh? I, I, all the glory, half, all enough. the glory, half the crap. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I never could have done that in 1991 when I came to the college. I looked around and I thought, what job am I qualified for other than the presidency? I certainly wasn't qualified to teach, and I looked around and I wasn't qualified for any of the positions of people reporting to me, and I thought the bookstore. Right. I could manage the bookstore. <laughs> and then I met the woman who was running the bookstore who spoke, I don't know how many languages and understood all the translations of everything we had on the program. And I said, I guess I can't do the bookstore. Can't do that. She can't shot, do the book shot your dream either. down. <laughs> no, that's right. So I stayed in office for that long because that's what I was qualified for. And now they've given me this promotion. So I'll be coming back. Uh, and I'm excited about that. But Joyce is also coming back. She's two thirds of the way through getting her second or third master's degree. She's at, at St. John's. She retired a couple of years ago and uh, will come back to complete her degree requirements. And she's excited about that. So she's taking a little break as well in going away for the year and then coming back. Well, it certainly sounds like it's been a, a lifetime of education for you from your father back in your youth to the books to, the, to St. John's for a more than a quarter century, which probably makes you sound older than you are, but I mean, it's a, it is what it is. Yeah, and uh, you know, quite a storied career, quite a uh, a big mark left on the campus, that's for sure. St. John's is the third oldest school in the country, college in the country. It traces its origins back to 1696, when it was a secondary school called King William School, and it was right across the street from the State House at the time. When we became a new republic. There was a good reason to jettison the name King William, uh, and so they uh, chose the name St. John's. Happened to be George Washington, and enrolling his stepson and nephew uh, at at St. John's College, uh, came and visited on St. John's the Evangelist Day. It was the Freemasons' principal saint, and uh, uh, we changed the name about that time, but also enrolled students who then were completing their grammar school, high school, and college. So the first graduates, graduating class as a four-year college included Francis Scott Key, for example. And it included all of these names that are famous around uh, Annapolis. All right. Well, you just name drop Francis Scott Key here. Can you name drop, name drop some other graduates? Do you have any on the top of your head? Josh Cohen. Josh Cohen, yes, former mayor. <laughs> Josh Cohen. He didn't uh, crack. He didn't win. <laughs> hey, hey, can we talk about that? What, 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 what happened? 25 yeah, years, I'm doing the math. <laughs> yeah, pull that file out. Look at the file cabinet you know, there. The, the good news is that he left the college from the Santa Fe campus. Oh, yeah. So it's a complete mystery to me, and I can't help you there. <laughs> well, it's a desert. It's easy to get in trouble. Uh, yeah, he said it was very easy to get into trouble and very hard to get kicked out. So, <laughs> Well, he did it. He put his mind yeah. to it, and boom. Oh, um, yeah. I, mean, I mean, I know you've had... What, is it Ahmed Erdogan? Ahmed Erdogan, yes, the founder of Atlantic Records. Yep. Uh, Paul Mellon of the uh, Mellon Foundation. Right. Uh, and the man who donated all so many of the great works of art to the National Gallery in the West Wing. Uh, by, by the way, I want to interrupt you. Mitchell Gallery, a hidden, hidden, hidden gem in Annapolis. It really is a beautiful um, place. This is not a high school art gallery. This is not even just a college art. I mean, this is the real deal. This is Smithsonian level artworks coming in here. Very small. They do a great job curating. They've got different things. Be a member. Come here. Come check it out. It's the St. John's College. Absolutely. It's just that's one of my favorite hidden gems of Annapolis that not many people know about. That's right. I mean, it's extraordinary. We do have exhibits from time to time of contemporary artists and local artists who want to show their things in town. But for the most part, the major exhibits, these are some of the great classic 
classical artists uh, that the world has known. And that gallery was established in considerable part by a couple of other uh, well-known Annapolitans and alumni. Uh, Jean Thaw, who was an art critic and helped to build Paul Mellon's art collection, most of which Paul Mellon then donated to others, was one of our alumni. And he, along with Elizabeth Mitchell Myers, Zibby Mitchell, put up the funding through the sale of some of her art uh, to build the Mitchell Gallery. And it was his idea, their idea from the beginning, that this not be a permanent collection, but that it be a rotating collection where we would bring exhibits that were put together for traveling exhibits around the country. Uh, We occasionally assemble our own, but it's... uh, it's quite a well-run operation. No, it is. It's definitely something there. Um, has, has the campus expanded much since you've been here? Well, four of our buildings were built since I've been here. Mm-hmm. So two of them are dormitories. One of them is the building for the advancement uh, office and alumni affairs. And what's the fourth building? Well, it'll come to me in a minute. But every <laughs> every building on campus has undergone uh, renovation. considerable and, right. renovation. And uh, so those changes are evident. The size of the college when I came was about 400. The size today is between 425 and 450. 450 is a number that we're comfortable with. We don't want to grow beyond 500. Uh, are they all residents? No. I think probably uh, 80% of our students live on campus. Now, all of freshmen are required to live on campus unless there's a very special case, somebody needing, you know, having physical needs of some kind. Uh, And then we try to put up as many as want to stay. But I think it's, um, it's in any small college, there's often a desire and a need to break away a little bit. And as the students get comfortable with the community here, many of them uh, find their way into the community of Annapolis. Sure. Yeah. Well, I know there were some uh, graduates, and I'd drawn a blank on his name. You know, I'm not. Kyle Stewart. Who, oh, yeah. Uh, Annapolis Sound? He, did the, he started this website that was called the Annapolis Sound at one point, and he's relocated to Florida. But he was just, it, was, it was phenomenal. And, he's uh, ahead he, of his time with that. And he had a whole bunch of people. He did the stories on the bells and, and the bells in town and everything else. But it's uh, uh, St. John's College has a really just a very storied history, third oldest in the, in the country. I'm not sure where you stand as far as 10 years of presidents of, of colleges, but 25 years or 26 years is certainly a... Well, right now it's the senior uh, presidency in the state of Maryland, both public and private, four-year and two-year colleges. Uh, we have a group of national liberal arts colleges that come together in Annapolis called the Annapolis Group. We started this group back in 1993. They come every June, so they're going to be coming for a crab feast on our back lawn. And then we'll have two days of uh, conferences uh, to help people think out loud together about the challenges facing colleges and universities, whether they're the free speech issues, issues of how to handle uh, Title IX, sexual abuse, whether it's uh, public speakers or just the promotion of liberal education. The presidents all get together and the deans get together. Uh, This group has grown in its influence over, over the years as well. Well, we better let you get ready yeah. for that, and uh, you got to finish your commencement speech, and you got to start packing up your stuff. So, That's uh, right. We want to appreciate uh, we appreciate you letting us come in and talking with us, oh, and this has been, been fantastic. A, been a real pleasure. All the best of luck, and uh, look to hear more great things in about a year when you come back to campus. Thank you. <laughs> thanks. Thanks very much. And that was President Nelson. Cool office. Not what I was expecting. So to give you folks a uh, visualization, we walked into the office, which was not that big. It was, uh, you know, I was surprised. It was small for, for a college president and less intimidating yeah, than I thought it would be. maybe 10 by 20. So it was filled by with eclectic. I mean, we had Thai art. We had little Buddhas in there. We had there uh, African art. There was Zuni. Uh, I, think he, I, think he, I, think he, I think he was like sneaking down to the Mitchell Gallery at night and stealing stuff. And then in the corner, he, it was really cool. He had the secretary, the you know the, the Armor, bookcase, the arm, yeah, which was owned by Francis Scott Key. Yeah. And he said, he told us, he goes, and the story is fascinating. And I said, oh, I can't wait to get into it. And then we never got into it. So yeah. I don't know what the story is. So I'm going to be wondering about this for yeah. a while. Maybe we should call him. 
He gave us his card. Well, it was interesting because we, uh, I, I was looking around. I was looking at his bookshelf behind him, and he's got, he's got, he walks the walk. He's got Plato. He's got Aristotle. He's got, you know, he's got all the classics that are back there on yeah, the bookshelf. Yeah, I felt pretty stupid when I was looking at that stuff. Uh, we looked hard and long and hard for Josh Cohen's academic records, but we couldn't uh, find him. Still under seal. The form, former mayor of Annapolis who spent some time at St. John's College before three years. Right? Before uh, I don't know whether he did three. Oh. Uh, before he uh, went, end up graduating at University of Maryland, but I love being on a college campus. There's just so much energy there. It's just you know, it is. It's that reminds me. Like I, whenever I go back to my alma mater, which I do quite frequently. I mean, I taught there this semester, and I'm on the alumni board there, and and. Uh, I guess I'm, I'm about to finish that up, but just when you get on, you just feel so energized. Don't feel like it's you feel just so insulated from the world. Well, it is. It's, it's youth. It's uh, yeah. It's everything that we you know pretty much don't have anymore as adults. But I was telling you before. I said that whenever we go to a wedding, my wife is always gets kind of you know wet eyed looking at the young couple about to embark upon their lives together, and you know she just gets really nostalgic about that. But I feel that way in August whenever I see students driving to school with their cars jammed full of stuff. I'm just right. like oh. Uh-huh. Yeah. Go drink. I want to be there. I want to be there. I know. That was the best. And one thing that was really cool, we were sitting there talking, and, uh, and Chris didn't see this, but behind him, he's yeah. got the uh, the quad out. Back yeah, so, so we're, yeah, we're, we're looking over his shoulder, and they're the, like out onto the quad, and then we were totally, for about three minutes, not listening to a word he said yeah. because we were so distracted. There was like a woman and a little girl who couldn't have been but maybe two, and they're playing, with, thing in the world playing and with hula hoops, and it was well, just so distracting. It was funny as hell. And it was it was really nice. I've got a picture. I'll, throw, I'll, I'll put a picture up in the show notes on that uh, with that, but that was uh, it was really interesting. I think uh, you know Chris Nelson has really made his mark on Annapolis and uh, actually education. Yeah, well deserved uh, retirement. Sure. Although he's coming back. Uh, so like for Hotel California. <laughs> No. But uh, so what do we have coming up? So we have some stuff. We're getting to election season in Annapolis. So. We do. We've got, we've got some. We're going to be talking with Nevin Young, yep, who is finally. The, the, rem, the remaining candidate we've had some false for starts the on city that. of mayor. Uh, we are going to be talking to some students that are graduating from Anne Arundel County Public Schools and get their opinions about what's happening. Uh, and talk about teachers that have influenced their lives. Yep. We've got a, we've got a whole bunch of stuff. We've got, the, uh, Navy, we've got a, an episode about the Navy ship. The USS Sioux City, which will be christened here in Annapolis. Yeah, I wasn't there for that. You didn't tell me about that. Uh, yeah, no. So we uh, we've got a, we've got a bunch of stuff coming up. We've got a bunch on the way, and we are working on the political stuff. We've actually put oh yeah pen to paper, and we're actually coming up with concepts because we have the primaries coming up, and then we'll have the general uh, the city elections, and we have it's going to be an exciting one. This one we have. Uh, all the people are lining up for, I mean, I think even traditionally uncontested wards. We're going to have people. Yeah, Sheila Thin Layson has, a, has, a, has a, an opponent now. Yeah, we got a couple in Ward 7, I think. Uh, we got a couple in Ward 6. Yeah, there's three and seven. There's like three or four and six. So, which is good. Two, so. so that's exciting. So what we're going to do is that we're going to we're gonna try and cover this wall-to-wall because this is our first election that we're covering. So we're working on some debate stuff, and, and we're going to do some live stuff, uh, live debates where we're going to have people, quest- people there. We're going to have people sending in questions via Twitter and Facebook. We're going to Facebook live it. We're going to YouTube live it. So we're figuring all that out right now. That's probably going to be in early July. Right. And we're looking at either a week, day, evening, mm-hmm. or a weekend mid-afternoon. Yeah, so we're going to try that, and we're going to have all of the candidates who want to participate. Uh, so we're still figuring it out, but it is going to happen. And also, we're going to have the candidates in to talk to us, and we're still deciding if those are going to be the crab cakes, and those are the little ep- little episode lits. That episode lets they really have to be when we talk to yeah the, because we have uh, so with, many with candidates all, all, with the automatic candidates I mean if we have three per you know that's twenty four and we're, we're weekly so it's there's no we way just don't there's no way we could put them all in so we're going to figure out whether that's going to be one episode with like four epi- four candidates or if they're going to be special episodes so we're figuring all that out uh, I'm still trying to talk John into going to twice a week but um, every time he does he hangs up on me definitely stay tuned we got a lot of exciting stuff going on here for the city of Annapolis if you've got any other ideas for stuff that you want we we love your suggestions we love the ideas we've gotten a couple and we have gotten to, yeah we've gotten we gotten a bunch of them some we can't do some have been great some have been after the fact in the mail i mean we're talking about uh you know we got some library stuff that's coming up that uh or we're looking at looking into doing some stuff with the uh libraries and how they're changing and everything else throughout so and we got some fun stuff i got a lot of uh, lines in the water we have captain 20 he's gonna be coming up we're gonna meet with him in, in early june who to- <laughs> if you grew up in Montgomery County or D.C. or Prince George's County, you know who Captain 20 is. And that I'm so excited for that one. Uh, there's a few other people that we're trying. I, famous people. I don't want to spoil it, but they're, uh, I'm talking to their handlers and their assistants right now. So I've gotten through. You finally got Bono, huh? I've gotten through the first line, and I'm talking to people. I guess we're going to stalk uh, Cal Ripken a little bit more, uh, get him on. 
that will happen. Yeah, yeah. The, the restraining order. We, we, we have to lay down in front of his driveway. But uh, in the meantime, we're going to keep you abreast of everything that we're doing. You can find us on Facebook. We have a page and we have a group. You can find us at Twitter at MD Crabs Podcast. John's at Ian Annapolis. I'm at Tim Hamilton forty seven. You can friend either of us on Facebook. Send us an email at info at the Crabs dot com. Our website's the Maryland Crabs dot com. You can find us on Apple Podcasts or what is that now? It's, it's Apple, Apple Podcasts. Apple Podcasts. Which used to be iTunes. Yep. Google Play. Uh, we're going to be on YouTube soon. Stitcher. So, right. Uh, Alexa. Alexa always works. Yep. So uh, we're kind of everywhere. Um, keep keep the, the, the comments coming because they are starting to come in. Uh, even the constructive criticism, we <laughs> I, don't, I don't read those. No, I take it well. Tim doesn't. I do not. I don't. I say I want criticism. I'm like, I can, and after a minute, I'm like, you know what? Shut your face. <laughs> Alexa's so, talking right Alexa's now. talking to you. So in the meantime, follow us in all those places and stay tuned to us throughout the uh, election because we're going to have some fun and we're going to have some events coming up. So until then, uh, we'll see you next week. This has been the Maryland Crabs Podcast with Tim Hamilton and John Fernay. Sure to follow them in all the regular places, Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and online at themarylandcrabs.com. Take a moment to rate us on iTunes. Now get the hell out of my kitchen. Seriously. Go! You're still here? It's over. Go home.